That was cool. <laughs> oh, welcome to uh, worship this morning at Covenant Presbyterian Church. Covenant is an accepting, welcoming community sharing the glory of God's love with all. And so glad that uh, you are here. Those of you who are here in person, glad that you're here. All of you who have brought your children, we're so glad that you are here as well. For those of you who don't know, we now have our service being streamed in different parts of the uh, uh, church building. And so if, if some of you adults sometimes might find it a little distracting in here, you are, are welcome to utilize those other spaces as well. Uh, both out in the hallway and in the lounge and, and in Fellowship Hall. We've got our service streaming, and of course that's available to, uh, to all of us. So part of the reason we're doing that is to make this place as, as welcoming and accessible for uh, as many of us as possible. And so, so glad that, that you are here today. Uh, we are taking up our Christmas Joy offering, one of the four Peace USA offerings. You've got the envelope in your uh, uh, bulletin insert there. You're welcome to make use of that. Uh, and... Um, we are also got our Christmas cookies, if you didn't see, on display out there. Those are available for purchase. CPW has been working really hard to get those baked and packed and ready to go for you today uh, to give as gifts. And the proceeds, of course, go to missions, as CPW is so good at raising uh, money for. Uh, someone trying to get my attention there? They're delicious. Yes, I've taste tested them. They are delicious. <laughs> Yeah, they're wonderful. So grab yourself some cookies and uh, give them as gifts and you will be well loved uh, this Christmas season. Next Sunday uh, is our choir music Sunday and so we've got several special pieces the choir is preparing. So I hope that you'll uh, be here next Sunday for, for that. And it's also our Christmas brunch. So right after worship, uh, we are having a brunch and you've had one of these inserts in your bulletins the last several weeks. If you haven't filled one out, we'd ask you to do so, both to tell us that you're coming and if you're willing to help set up and or bring some food to make this brunch possible, uh, we'd love your support for that end. Um, now, I, I often ask us to, you know, say hello to folks who are here online. Let's go ahead and do that. But before we do, uh, we, have, we have someone who's turning 100 years old tomorrow and that's Anna Jo Beeson. I don't believe she's here with us in person. Do we see her? I don't think so. And so, or is she here? No, no. Um, so, but I think she's tuning in online. So why don't we wave to Anna Jo and let's sing happy birthday to her. Joe, we celebrate you. We're uh, so glad that you've been a part of our lives here at Covenant for many years. Hazel Ginther is here today as well. So if you haven't said hi to Hazel in a minute, uh, make sure that you do that either during the passing of the piece or later on after the service as well. If you have any prayer requests, please uh, fill those out on the prayer request forms and hand those to the ushers during our opening hymn. Just a, a note, if you are one who likes to follow along in your hymnal, our closing hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, is actually 121. It's listed as 129 in the bulletin. It's 121 in your hymnal. Make note of that if you're one who likes to see the music. And finally, if you'd be willing to uh, fill out the attendance pads and pass them on down to your neighbors, we would certainly appreciate that. So with all that said, kids, if you've got your uh, candles, why don't you go ahead and pull those candles out for our Advent wreath lighting. And those of you who are helping light our Advent wreath, come on up here. Over a hundred people from the ages of two to 80 years old were asked the question, what brings you joy? From the voices of different generations, hear their answers. A clean kitchen. <laughs> Sand between my toes. Feet outside. 
sleeping in my own bed after a night away. <laughs> Having a camera in my hands. My partner's laugh. Mountain air. When my parents pick me up. The end of my to-do list. <laughs> Hugs from nieces and nephews. Baby giggles. My cat. Putting my hands in the garden. A chord resolved. Stargazing. Bedtime books. A warm cup of coffee with friends. My new granddaughter. Lingering at the table after dinner. Time with family. Today we light the candle of joy. May its light remind us of all the good news this season brings. May its light remind us of the new, many sources of joy in our lives. And may that joy not only draw us closer to one another, but closer to God. Family of faith, what brings you joy? Amen. be seated. A series of experiments by Princeton psychologists Janine Willis and Alexander Todorov taught the world that it only takes a tenth of a second for us to form an impression of a stranger. In other words, it only takes a tenth of a second for us to look at someone's face and determine a stereo stereotype about who they are. With decisions happening that, quick, that quickly, it is not hard to imagine why we might need this moment of confession. The prayer of confession is an opportunity to slow down. We take that tenth of a second and give it room to breathe. We reflect on the decisions that we've made this past week, and we ask for God's mercy to be in all of them. And without fail, God wiggles God's self into the cracks of our lives, and we are made better for it. So with that confidence, 
let us go to God in prayer. God of mercy, a million times a day, we have the opportunity to be gracious, to assume the best in others, to give the benefit of the doubt. A million times a day, we could choose the better way, but so often we don't. Fear and greed kick in. Assumptions and insecurities take the wheel. Comparison and critique lead the charge. Forgive us for forgetting that we are descendants of Joseph. Forgive us for forgetting that grace and mercy are in our blood. Forgive us for forgetting that all belong to you. Give us the courage to love even bigger than before and the wisdom to choose a better way. Amen. Family of faith, hear this good news. And we who have chosen the coward's way are given another chance. We who have made a mess of things are cleaned up by God's grace and forgiveness. We who feel alone are seen and held and known. Hear again the good news of the gospel that in Jesus Christ you are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's judgment is not vengeance, an eye for an eye. God's peace is not a veil for injustice. No, God comes and breaks the spear and silences the guns and brings peace in our hearts and in our world. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to share God's peace with your neighbor. friends. Oh, I think Brian forgot to turn my microphone on because none of you answered me. Do you just didn't hear me? Or are you ignoring me? Good morning, friends. Good morning. 
so glad you're here and be so good morning. All right, what week are we on of Advent? What number? Three. And the third week is what? The joy. You're right. Anybody feeling joyful today? A little. Yesterday. Yesterday you felt joy? Good. That's good to recognize. So do you guys remember the song? I'm in right, out right, up right, down right. You remember that song? No. Well, I guess I don't have anything to say then. That was my whole lesson. We're all done. All right. Grown-ups, do you remember that song? Do you remember what comes next when you learned it? I'm in right, out right, up right, down right. Happy all the time. Thank you. And then it said, by the way, you're welcome for my singing. Are you trying to sign me up over there? Yeah, you're welcome. We have it stopped. I know. <laughs> then it says, with Jesus in my heart, he never will depart. I'm happy all the time. That's me. Happy all the time. All the time I'm happy. Are you happy all the time? No. It says, with Jesus in your heart, you're going to be happy all the time. Not everyone's happy all the time. You are exactly right. No, we're not happy all the time. And joy is even deeper than being happy, right? And so adults, are happy all the time. adults are not happy all the time. I'm a little worried about what's going to come next out of your mouth. It's true. No one's happy all the time, right? Yeah, sometimes we're sad. Sometimes we're lonely. Sometimes we're angry. We have lots and lots and lots of feelings, right? And so we're not going to be joyful all the time. Even with Jesus in our heart. Hi, Daddy. Hi, Daddy. We've got Jesus in our heart. Jesus is not going to leave us, but we're probably not going to be happy all the time. So years and years and years ago, Mrs. Halsey and I had a conversation about this. Because it's really important that when we teach things to children, we don't teach things that we're going to have to unteach later. Are you feeling happy all the time? And so we changed it. So I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, filled with joy and love because that feels a little bit better. Because even when we're feeling sad, we still do have joy in our body, in our hearts. We can feel joyful and we can feel sad. We can feel joyful and we can feel a little bit lonely, right? Those things can all exist at the same time. There's so much joy here today. <laughs> Perfect. All right, should we pray? Will you pray with me? Beautiful God, we thank you for joy. We thank you for children who remind us of what it is like to be filled to overflowing with joy. And we know that sometimes, even when we are filled with joy and have Jesus in our heart, we still might be a little bit sad. And that's okay too, because we have Jesus, we have your love, and we have joy in our heart. And everyone says, amen. amen. I will bring the coloring out here. You may go back to your grown-ups, or you may stay up here with us and color. The prayer for illumination. Holy God, scripture tells us that you came to Joseph through an angel, loud and clear, impossible to miss. Scripture also tells us that Joseph listened. He rearranged his life to follow your invitation. God, we long for that, all of that. We long to hear your voice, loud and clear, impossible to miss. We long for invitations to something more, something deeper. And we long to be like Joseph and find the courage to follow. So clean out our ears, brush the dust off our hearts. Trace us back to our roots, back to Joseph, 
who heard and followed. With gratitude we listen. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 through 10. The desert and the dry land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. They will burst into bloom and rejoice with joy and singing. They will receive the glory of Lebanon, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. Sharon. They will see the Lord's glory, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and support the unsteady knees. Say to those who are panicking, be strong, don't fear. Here's your God, coming with vengeance, with divine retribution. God will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be cleared. Then the lame will leap like the deer, and the tongue of the speechless will sing. Waters will spring up in the desert and streams in the wilderness. The burning sand will become a pool, and the thirsty ground fountains of water. The jackal's habitat a pasture. Grass will become reeds and rushes. A highway will be there. It will be called the Holy Way. The unclean won't travel on it, but it will be for those walking on that way. Even fools won't get lost on it. No lion will be there, and no predator will go up on it. None of these will be there. Only the redeemed will walk on it. The Lord's ransomed ones will return and enter Zion with singing with everlasting joy upon their heads. Happiness and joy will overwhelm them. Grief and groaning will flee away. This is the promise of God to our ancestors and to us. Thanks be to God.
I love preaching and having young ones right here uh, up front. You know, over the past two years, Covenant has received 30 new members into our roles. Uh, of those 30, 16 are under 18 years old. So uh, Covenant's a church that welcomes children, and uh, we make no apologies for that. In fact, we hold it up as one of our high values, and uh, so we're so glad, so glad that you're here, so glad that you're all here. Our gospel reading is from uh, Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Listen to the word of the Lord. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph, before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off the engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as an angel from God commanded him and took Mary as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. Joseph called him Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's pray. God with us, born by Mary's flesh, beyond all convention. Give us the faith of Joseph to see the Spirit's work, where the world sees only shame. To listen to the promise and waken to the cry of life renewed and love reborn. Through Jesus Christ, the one who is to come. Amen. Our lives are made up of a series of countless choices, most of which go by completely unnoticed. And the sum of those choices is our life. Those choices amount to both who we are and how we will be remembered. How will this generation be remembered? as those who chose courage or cowardice. Now, from generation to generation, there are people in our lives who have shown us what it means to choose a better way. I I wonder who those people are in your life. My grandpa Schultz was someone who showed me what it looks like to choose a better way. He was a righteous man who knew loss and suffering, yet still managed to live a beautiful life. He and my grandma had uh, five children. My mother was the third, sandwiched between four brothers. Uh, Her two older brothers died before I was born, one of a brain tumor, the other in a military helicopter exercise. And ten years after that, my grandmother had a massive stroke, and it upended all of their retirement plans. And so instead of retiring into the woods of Arkansas, To spend their last days, instead they moved to Ohio, where my grandpa learned how to cook, how to clean, and how to care for his now disabled wife. I I have these memories throughout my adolescence of every Sunday, grandpa taking out these uh, portable metal ramps from his minivan and putting them uh, on our steps so that they could come and have dinner with us. In many ways, my grandpa's life did not turn out the way he had hoped, and he could have chosen the path of anger or bitterness, and yet he lived a life of faithfulness and hope. We can choose a better way. 
after reporting to us his unlikely genealogy that had five women included in it, none of whom we would expect to be in a royal family tree, Matthew gives us his version of the Annunciation and the Nativity, but he does it from Joseph's perspective. We know precious little about Joseph. Tradition has told us that he was an older man, but the Bible says nothing of this. He may well have been a young man. Josephus, the Jewish historian from that time, reported that 18 years old was the ideal age for a Jewish man to marry. So perhaps he was as young as 18, but the truth is we don't know. What we do know is that he's engaged, and he finds out that Mary is pregnant. And Matthew tells us that he resolves to end the engagement quietly because he didn't want to humiliate her. And for that reason, Matthew calls him a righteous man. And that's really, really interesting. Joseph is a righteous man, a just man, because he refuses to humiliate Mary. And yet, his Bible instructed him to do far worse than simply humiliate Mary. Deuteronomy 22 outlines what the community is to do when an engaged woman is found to have been intimate with a man other than her betrothed. It says, you must bring both of them out to the city gates and stone them until they die. Remove such evil from your community. Now, in Mary's case, had Joseph chosen this path, presumably you could have only chosen her because there was no man to be found. But However he chose to do it, it is not hard to imagine Joseph choosing a punitive path with Mary and then justifying those actions on the basis of Scripture. I mean, after all, you can read it. Deuteronomy, it's pretty black and white, isn't it? I mean, it's right there. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. But instead, Joseph chooses a better way, a more compassionate way, one that may have put him at odds with his community and put him in conflict with the Bible. He chose not to obey Deuteronomy. And that's what makes Joseph righteous. And so here we have a story in the Bible where a man who doesn't obey the Bible, and then the Bible calls him righteous for doing so. That's pretty cool. It's incredible, really. You see, the Bible is like life itself. It is not simple. To be faithful takes wisdom. It takes compassion, not blind obedience. And Joseph's willingness to live in the gray, to not live in the black and white, his decision to err on the side of compassion, that is what makes him righteous. And so it turns out that God isn't looking for people who blindly stand up for the truth. God, stand up for the truth. No, God is looking for people who choose life over laws, people over principles, compassion over judgment. That was true 2,000 years ago, and it is just as true today. We can choose a better way. Our lives, your life, my life, it is full of choices about how we treat other people. Will we choose compassion or will we choose judgment? You can't do both. You have to choose. Jesus' life and ministry demonstrates again and again that mercy triumphs over judgment. And maybe, just maybe, Jesus learned that from his adoptive father, Joseph. So let's get real for a moment. As children, many of us, I would guess most of us, were taught very black and white rules about marriage, about sexuality. Uh, We were taught that marriage is between one man and one woman for life. And anyone who steps outside of that black and white rule at best is foolish and at worst is evil. That's what we were taught. When it comes to the LGBT community, we were taught to choose judgment, weren't we? We were. But the good news is, my friends, we can choose a better way. 
one where we put people above principles, compassion above judgment. And I know it can be scary. I know it can put you at odds with your community. It can make you feel like you're betraying what you were taught as a child. It can even make you feel as though you are somehow out of line with God. But what Joseph shows us and what Jesus will learn is that when we choose mercy over judgment, we are always choosing the better way. Compassion is the better way. But we need more than just compassion. Had Joseph simply chosen compassion, well, Mary presumably wouldn't have been killed, but Jesus would never have had a father. Joseph needed courage as well. And to get there, God intervenes through a dream. And so Joseph, like his Old Testament namesake, you remember the one with the technicolor dream coat? Both of them are dreamers. Joseph, in the first two chapters of Matthew, has four dreams, and he believes that all of them are from God, and he obeys all of them. Now, I've heard a lot of sermons in my life, given a few. Um, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon that says, you should really consider whether or not your dreams are from God. I've heard that from Disney, (laughs) but I have not been taught that by the church. And I think the reason that we are hesitant to trust our dreams is because we have been trained to mistrust ourselves. See, most Christians are taught, if you need guidance, you go to the Bible. You certainly don't look within yourself. Yet had Joseph done that, Mary... And the Christ child that she carried might well have been stoned. Joseph had the audacity to believe that his deepest self was good and therefore can be trusted. And this is, this is perhaps the most courageous thing that any of us can ever do. To trust that our core self is good. That our hearts are good and will not mislead us but lead us back to God. Joseph learns to trust both his heart and Mary's, and it took great courage and took great vulnerability. By staying with Mary, by raising Jesus as his own, Joseph makes himself vulnerable to all of the whispers that would follow the three of them for the rest of their lives. But far more significant than that, Joseph makes himself vulnerable to a powerful, murderous, narcissistic King Herod. And that's what Joseph stood to lose by staying with Mary. What did he stand to lose? Everything. This is the cost of choosing a better way. So we should ask, was it worth it? (laughs) Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it was worth it to him, to Mary, to Jesus, and to every one of us. Without Joseph's courage, we wouldn't be here right now. The cost of love is both courage and vulnerability. And the reward of love is everything that matters most to us. It reverberates beyond ourselves in ways that we will never know. Grandpa Schultz chose a better way. He didn't choose to be bitter or resentful because his life didn't turn out the way that he imagined, but instead, in his old age, learned to cook and to clean and to care for his wife for two decades plus. And those small acts of faithfulness added up to a beautiful life, and his choices still reverberate in my life, even from the grave. So our lives are a series of choices, most of which go by unnoticed, and the sum of those choices is how we will be remembered. But as our prayer confession said, every day we're given a million opportunities to choose the better way, but so often we don't. Too often we choose the path of least resistance. Too often we choose not to listen to those voices on the margins, those who are pleading with us for compassion. And they are met only by our indifference. 
And so while our choices do matter, the good news of the gospel is that God's choice of us is what matters most. In the end, your choices, though important, are not the final word. And thank God for that. The story of Christmas is the story of a God who chose the way of compassion, the way of courage, the way of vulnerability for our sake. A God who takes on flesh, who put relationships over rules, mercy over judgment, not just once or twice, but over and over and forevermore, all so that God might be near to us. Beloved, God has chosen every has chosen to risk everything to be near to you. So that in all of your choices, both the cowardly and the courageous, you might know that you are loved with an everlasting love. And there is nothing that God will not do. There is nothing that God will not risk just to be near to you. That's the story of Christmas. And it's the best news that any of us have ever heard. Let's pray. God of stepfathers and adopted parents. God of angel messengers and newborn kings. We bow our heads today with praise on our lips and joy in our hearts. For who else but you would pick two ordinary people to be God's parents? And who else would, but you would be patient enough to lead Mary and Joseph back to one another. And who else but you would assume the best of our fragile human hearts? There is no one, for you alone are our God. And in your grace and in your devotion, you open the door for us to see a new day. So today we pray, help us, Lord, that we might choose courage like Joseph, who reminds us that grace is within reach. In a world full of competition, help us choose celebration. In a world full of scarcity, help us choose abundance. In a world of war and violence, help us to choose peace and grace. In a world of divided lines, help us choose connection and relationship. In a world of quick assumptions and stereotypes, help us choose compassion and curiosity. We pray for those who have been harmed and excluded in the name of God. We pray for the LGBT community, for people of color, for our Jewish siblings who are facing a rise in anti-Semitism. Lord, may we be a community that chooses the way of compassion and courage, standing in solidarity with all who are in need. We pray for those we love who are in need of your healing presence for Sarah Cosgray, for William Wallace, for Jason Guthrie, Nancy Kalman, for Patrick, for Bruce, for all those that we have carried with us whom we lift to you now. And Lord, we give you thanks as well for this covenant community who prayed for a mother and her child's high-risk pregnancy last year. And it is with thanksgiving that the healthy baby boy will soon celebrate his first birthday and is a delight to his parents, his four siblings, and his grandparents. Lord, in all of our striving to choose a better way, may we be transformed. May this story of Joseph rattle something loose in us. May this story help us to drop the need to be right or to be the best 
or to have it all figured out and instead draw us closer to authenticity and to you. May this story of imperfection sow grace into our bones. May we catch glimpses of your love in our world. And may we shake the dust off of our old selves and live into something new. It is with hope in our hearts that we pray in the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are grateful for your generous support of Covenant. Your financial gifts allow us to pay for the cost of this building, pay our staff, and support church workers and students in need across the country through the Christmas Joy Offering. If you are watching online and have been blessed by the ministry of this church, you can give through our website, covenantpcusa.org slash giving. All that we have is the Lord's. All, the, all that we may become and receive is in God's hands. For the sake of the joy that is ours when our bonds grow deep with others, let us give generously for the well-being of the world. Oh, dude.
you bless us with many gifts. You retrieve us from despair and fear. You visit us with surprising proclamations, and you intend for us good things. We thank you for your steadfast love, for sending signs of assurance, and for the gift of faith. Use our gifts to bring comfort and justice to those in need, reforming the ways of our world for the sake of new life. Amen. from this place with compassion and courage in your hearts, choosing people over principles and mercy over judgment. See one another, hear one another, care for one another, and love one another, for it is all that easy and it is all that hard. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.